and we'll record. Okay. Well, I'll start up from there. But uh, what I was saying about this being I mean, preparing for a hybrid class, uh, has anybody ever had a hybrid? You know what a hybrid class is? That's where you do part of it here and part of it at home. And we're looking in the future of producing zoology hybrid classes and physiology hybrid classes where you come up here and take the test and do the labs, but you do everything else by way of instruction on the internet. And we're a video lecture, or I'm video lecture in my lecture, so they can see those out there. Um, people say, well, won't you do that for your regular class? Well, I never would get y'all to come here if I did that for y'all. So I got, I got to have somebody to talk to here every now and then. So that's why I'm doing this. <clears throat> the uh, assistance part up here, if you feel like you need a tutor, Learn Resource Center usually has one available. Uh, they used to ask me to recommend people. I have no idea who they hire anymore. They haven't asked me in years. So they may have somebody that can or cannot. Most of the time they usually have somebody pretty good. I think you'll find out that possibly your best uh, study buddy could be in this very class. I mean, just pay attention. Who makes the best, class, the best grade on the first couple tests? That's who I want to study with, right? So uh, a lot of times it's just a matter of perspective. And you can find somebody in here to study with as well. Now, I, I, think I have this counseling part in here mainly because of where I used to have my office. My office used to be right on a hallway at Johnson Hall over there. And everybody come down that hallway. Where math class, what coming through other buildings, post office was in that building, and they come down through there. And they'd see me there and just, I guess I just looked like I need to talk to them. So they'd sit down and they'd tell me, you know, Aunt Susie and, and Uncle Joe said they got divorced. And their divorce upset my mom so bad that that uh, she just couldn't take it anymore. And, and it drove Dad nuts. He went, he started drinking. And he was drunk one night, shot the dog. That upset my brother. And said, it's just a mess. Well, I didn't even know all that. You know, you can just see all that coming. By the time I got finished counseling through all that, they just walked out the back door of that building right out in the street and stood there until the truck come by. They didn't care anymore. <laughs> you don't want me counseling. I don't have a counseling degree. But I, my door is open for you to come talk to me about class. Uh, if you have questions about this class, concerns about this class, come talk to me. That's what I'm here for. But if you want me to counsel you, you may end up worse than you better hope you can get some antidepressants or something to, when I get finished with you. Syllabi statement, uh, simply, basically from Section 504 Rehabilitation Act 1973. If there's something you need to talk to me about, I need to help you with, just come see me. You can read through that on your own. <clears throat> this is kind of the way the class is designed. There's your chapters. First test is going to be over chapters one, two, three, and four. Uh, it won't take us very long to get through that. I'm going to give you some notes here in a minute, and that's basically what the test is over, so that'll be a good start. After that set of notes, there'll be some reference stuff in those that we'll use from time to time. We'll get to the fifth chapter and different chapters, but we'll uh, adhere to the book a lot. I'll throw in some stuff that's not in the book. We'll throw some stuff on the board, and we'll refer back to the book, and but just as beyond these notes, you're on your own with notes. But this is the introductory stuff anyway. The second test is uh, chapters 5 and 37. 37 is a long ecology chapter, and I've summed it up in some notes that I give you there. And chapter 5 is genetics. And it takes us a few class periods to get through chapter 5. And we spend quite a bit of time in lab. So by the time we get finished, you understand a little bit about genetics. And honestly, most people do pretty well on that test. Test three is the long test. You can see chapters 9, 10, 11, 14, 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, 23, and 24. So, oh my gosh, some of those chapters are really short. And then the ones that do have some length to them, we may not hit all the points in them. But it does take a little while to get through them. And because of the, I mean, this has protozoans in it. It has a lot of... Uh, uh, parasites in it, where it's internal, external, things like that. If any, of the, if any of this class will gross you out, it'll be this section. You'll change your way of life because of this section. You'll, uh, you'll learn things you wish you didn't know. Now you have more to worry about after this section. 
You know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> it's interesting, but I think you will change change the way you look at things and change the way you do a few things because of this section. These parasites will freak you out. There, uh, forty or fifty percent of us in here is wormy as we speak, and you're looking around seeing, oh, there's wormy in here, you know. So that's the kind of stuff we'll learn in those chapters. Test four uh, gets back to each one of these chapters gets a little closer to us. So test four here, 29, as you know, it's 25, 26, 27, 28. That would be, I believe, birds, uh, mammals, reptiles, uh, amphibians, I believe is what's in that one. So they're getting a little closer to us. Uh, mammals is us in that one. And then uh, test five, 29, 30, 31, 32, 35. Test five for me in the past has been a take home test. <coughs> And simply because I don't know who in their right mind can actually cover all these chapters. I mean, we run out of time. But there's a lot of stuff in test five that really corresponds to physiology and anatomy if you go on and take it, which a lot of y'all probably will. So test five will most likely be a take-home test, and I, and I may do it a little different this time and I'll kind of fill you in on that as we get there, but it, it'll probably still be a take-home test. It's uh, 70 or 80 questions, I think, on the take-home test, but I'm probably going to limit the amount of time you have with it. Uh, I think uh, I'm getting abused on that time frame. So. And then test six is 7, 8, 33, 34, and 36. So when test four is over with, a lot of times when I give test four, when you walk out, you'll take test five with you. If not, it'll be the next class period. And we'll immediately start lecturing for test six. So you'll be doing that at the same time I'm lecturing for test six. And, and I, do, I will give you ample time, but it, it may not be no full week or anything like that. I may give it on Tuesday, bring it back on Thursday, something like that. You can see over here, we talked this morning a little bit about this. Yeah. Microscope. We'll, we're going to start lab next week. And we're going to start on the microscope cells, tissues. I think page 23 in your lab books, the first page we're going to work on. We depends on where we're at, whether protista and ecology is going to get thrown in there. It may be dropped, probably. We'll move right into genetics. And then we may mix the pig ground here to end up at the bottom or something. But th this is what we're going to do. And it'll take a while. There's quite a bit of work in there to do it. So we'll eventually get that done. Just a reminder here, I told them in lab this morning, y'all need to go get a pair of goggles. Other than that, I think we can supply everything else. So you need to bring also a lead, uh, number two lead pencil and scantrons for testing here in lab just a piece of paper spine. The no contacts thing, if you're getting these goggles at the bookstore, I think you'd probably still be all right with contacts. Uh, we, we don't recommend them, but some people that's all they have and they can't see without them, so what else are you going to do? Safety glasses wasn't enough to cover the contacts. You can still get fumes in there and cause eye damage, so we, that's the reason that's in there. Turn your papers in on time. Oh, this is one here. I will post your grades after every lecture exam. Every time we take a test in here, not lab tests, not lab grades, every time we take a test in here, I'll post your grades right on the end right down there. You can look it up by your ID and, and see what you made on it. You can keep up with your lab grades. You know you turned it in, you look, see if it's on there. And uh, if something's missing, that's when you need to come see me. So every time we do a lecture test, within the next day or so, I'll get them posted on there, and you'll know where you're at. At the end of the semester, you'll know exactly where you're at. No, try not to hide anything. Academic integrity, uh, just cheating is all it is. It's, all I can say is don't get caught. It gets ugly if you get caught. You could probably spend possibly even less time actually learning material and making an honest grade than spending all the time making sure you don't get caught. Uh, just come take the test. Put your cell phones up when you take the test and don't look shifty and don't make me suspicious of you. And <laughs> take it and go home. I mean, just study. Uh, don't wait the night before the study either because you'll need more time than that. But that's basically what my academic integrity is about. And, and 
and does emphasize putting cell phones up on that particular day. <coughs> Since cell phones mentioned there, we'll drop on down here and talk about them. I'm, I'm not. Does anybody have Mr. Holt in class? Yeah, I mean, he's. You, if your cell phone goes off, he's just going to shoot you, right? I mean, he just. He's. No cell phones. He's just dead against it. I'm not quite that bad. Uh, I'd prefer him not to interrupt class, but. I'm the world's worst. I mean, I carry it in my pocket. I think Mr. Holton leaves his at, in his desk, but I may be up here and you guys can hear my phone buzzing in my pocket up here. And it's because my retired father can't remember that I'm at work. And he'll be calling and I think, oh man, dad's calling. It's got, it must be important. It's not. But the one time I won't answer it, it'll be important, you know. So there may be times that I'm expecting an important phone call or I may answer it. If I do, I'll go out the door, take care of it, get off the phone, come back, start lecturing again. If, if same thing, if you're expecting an important phone call, how many has children in here? You may get a call from the school, right? You never know. Step out that door and take care of it. If it's not that important, when you get done, come back in. If it's important, go take care of it. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. But, but limit the interruptions in class. And one thing to me that interrupts class more than anything is texting. So if, if you're texting somebody in class, I'm eventually going to call you down on it. I'll be pretty nice for a while, but limit it, text them back, say I'm in class later, something. But stop the texting. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to stop in the middle of class and send somebody a text, okay? So uh, the phone calls will work with it. I'm not a big sticker on it. It's modern times and modern technology. I'm not going to, I really honestly want you to bring your phone because there are going to be some topics we talk about and I'll tell you something and how many can look it up on the internet, right? You got a phone with the internet on? Just look that up. And sure enough, we'll come up with some freaky stuff out there now. So we utilize the phones actually in a lot of what we do in here. We'll, we'll look it up. Uh, grade appeal, that's in there. If, and like I said, you're going to know from the get-go what your grades are. And if we don't have it ironed out by the end of the semester, it's not going to get ironed out. But you're going to know. But there is an appeal process. If you and I can't work it out, then you go to my department chair, which is Mr. Holton. You and him can't work it out. You go to Dr. Yates. He's probably going to just give you all the paperwork necessary to file your appeal, and it will go to the appeals committee. I used to sit on the committee and we got a few, not, not a whole lot, but most of them we got was pretty legit. <clears throat> Students, uh, behavior, you just expect to act like an adult, no force play, <laughs> not being unruly, anything like that. And I will say this, one o'clock in the afternoon is a tough time of the day. It's almost as bad as eight o'clock in the morning. Y'all have any eight o'clock classes? Some of y'all need to try an 8 o'clock every now and then just to make you appreciate 1 o'clock. Right after lunch, you get sleepy. Y'all's going to have to do some talking or this is really going to be a long semester. Right now, I'm not seeing a lot of hope among you. I'm seeing some one eyelid going down and the other hanging on and some of you doing some weeping and wobbling out there. It's tough on me sometimes to sit up here right after lunch. There's a cell phone computer. This is a non-smoking facility, no tobacco products, so we don't have to worry about that. Cell phones, you may plan on bringing your laptop in here and taking notes on it. It usually doesn't work out well anyway, so I don't advise it. Email's a good way to get a hold of me, especially if you're sick. I don't want you to come personally tell me I'm sick <coughs> and cough all over me. Uh, let's see, students required to check their email accounts. I, I, I don't spend a lot of time trying to communicate with y'all. I expect y'all to be here, and that's when I'll communicate. If it's important, I'll probably look up your phone number and try to call you. That's the disclaimer here. You should not capture live animals to die at home. I was telling y'all in the lab about that this morning, and that's because it, it did happen. It didn't happen out here on this campus or really associated with the school, but uh, there was a science teacher in Oklahoma captured a live cat and uh, chloroformed the cat, so it, used a little anesthesia on the cat, and the cat was out, and opened the cat up in the classroom, and they was watching all the organs work. They was watching the heart pump, and they was watching, you know, the lungs, and do whatever it does, and 
but the cat came alive before he got it soaked back up. And the anesthesia didn't hold out as long as he needed it to. And then end up Peter got involved and he got lawsuits filed against him and end up having, I think he paid a fine, a pretty good sized fine and had to do a thousand hours of community service. And then it just, the school backed him though. The school run fundraisers and helped him pay the fine. And now that's education right there. We can replace a cat, but could you replace that moment? Never. So there's your disclaimer. Carl Albert doesn't want to get involved in y'all killing your neighbor's cat. Capstone, any, how many of y'all are allied health majors? Okay, so y'all to be taking the allied health capstone. How many of y'all are biological science, uh, vet, pre-med? Okay, you'd be taking our capstone here. So the capstone is in the process and there's some changes being made in the capstone and I don't know where it's gonna end up at. So you'll get caught in the middle of it, don't worry. Last thing is the uh, biological science degree outcomes. And uh, you can read those as well. Do you have any questions? No questions? At least your eyes are still open. You're hanging in there, aren't you? All right. Um, there's a handful of you that was not in lab this morning. And I need y'all to sign a paper. This basically you're going to be a guinea pig. Did you want to? Yeah. That part you need to keep and read. That part you need to sign. Who else? There seems like there's an awful lot of notes here, but notice large print, so that <laughs> drags it out. That helps me put it up on the overhead and talk about it in larger print. And there's some pages, there's not much on there, and some of it gets a little bit out of whack as we go. There's some in here that's not in, not actually in your text. The text still emphasizes a lot of chemistry background, and we don't do a lot, but we do some. You'll notice the last few pages of this are study guides. And that's why they call them study guides. If they, uh, if they were uh, test answers, it would be titled test answers. Uh, they will help you with a test, but you have to go above and beyond and just, just answering simple yes, no kind of questions on here. You need to gather more and uh, a concept. Uh, I guess gather more information on the concept to have a more understanding about the concept to, to help you. Now, I haven't changed study guides in a lot of years, but I've changed tests because it's the same concepts that's on the test. I just ask different questions. And 
so if you if you know quite a bit about the concept then you can answer any angle of the question that I may pose out there so these are not test questions on there that we're answering these are concepts on there that we're understanding so I've had people get finished with study guide and take the test and say there wasn't a thing on that test is on that study guide well I beg to differ because the, the study guide was actually taken from the test but again it was designed as concepts not here's test question number one if I was going to give you the test I might as well give you a take-home test so that's that's the idea behind those there's no requirement for you to use them if you don't want to use them don't use them I'm not going to make you turn them in there's no grade involved or anything like that but I do think they'll help I will spend a little bit of time when I'm finished with lecture to help you answer questions on this but when I open up for ask me a question for the, on the study guide if the first question is could you please answer number one through 21 I'm not going to I just lectured over it for three weeks so but if there's specifics I don't mind answering them at all and uh, be sure and ask those but I'm not going to go over the whole study guide again I do want you to do well on the test which is going to require you to work in ahead so you'll know what to ask on that day uh, other things if you come up from the study guides you'll run into some flow charts that's for the fish chapter that help break down the fish chapter a little bit and then you'll see one on chapter 11 protozoans and then there's one on chapter 9 and that's just part of chapter 9 but and then there's chapter 37 notes which is part of our second test and chapter 37 is actually huge but I've condensed what I want you to know into these notes right here and we'll talk about those when we get ready for that so there's things other than what's on test one in here that we'll use and, and they'll be very functional for you to study for, for the test so with that said do you have any questions at this point set of notes and I've tweaked it back and forth for years uh, I used to just uh, start putting them up there and, and start lecturing over them and then ended up all my students spent all their time writing and not listening and I just sit and wait for you to write that page down and then we can talk about it that's when I started printing them out now you can jot down little things that I say and beside these things as we go and it doesn't take near as much time you can still hear and listen so I'm going to start a little bit on this introductory stuff today, and uh, there's an introductory section that I want to get out, get out of the way. Besides that, we're told to keep you full time, so that's not coming from me. That's coming from the Vice President of Academic Affairs. He's the one that said keep you full time first day, so we'll get, we'll get your money's worth. And of course, if you ask questions, you know, it stalls us a little longer. But since you're not going to ask questions, we may cover the whole first chapter today. Who knows? General zoology, uh, study of animals, is basically what this is about. And in the very first chapter, and they do this in biology as well, they try to describe or put a definition to the term biology or the term what is life. And they couldn't. They couldn't just define it the way they wanted to. So they started writing down, well, what does life consist of? Well, it consists of all these characteristics. So this is, and you'll have a test question. The test question will be something like, uh, which of the following is not a characteristic of life? And if you know the characteristics of life that we're fixing to go over, you'll recognize that that's not one of them. So that's, that's the kind of question that'll be off of that. So in describing life, these are the characteristics you come up with. Number one, a chemical uniqueness. Uh, would you agree even in the human race and the human species that each individual is chemically unique. Your DNA is different than the next person, isn't it? So even if, even if within the species, your your makeup is unique. And they list different things: nucleic acid, which is your DNA, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids. Now these are all chemical uniqueness. Uh, each one of these could be slightly different. The second uh, general property is complexity and hierarchical organization. 
And this is what one you need to remember, cells, tissues, organs, and systems. It, you're organized in that way. And we could back up actually a little bit uh, in front of cells and tissues and we could put atoms and molecules. So if you really get back into chemistry and get technical, we have atoms, molecules, and then we get into cells, tissues, organs, and systems. But that's, that's just basic organization and somewhat how the books put their stuff together as we study it. We'll spend uh, a little bit of time here on test one on cells and tissues a little bit on test one. Uh, your test five, your take home test, deals a lot with the organs and the systems. Now we'll talk a lot about those as we go through these animal chapters. And you'll see a lot of overlap in all these chapters, which is good because with repetitiveness helps us learn. Number three, if it's a living thing, it must be able to reproduce. If it cannot reproduce, it's not alive. Does rocks reproduce? They seem to on my property. I pick up one and four more is there tomorrow. But technically not. But if it cannot reproduce, it's not alive. So that's a, to me, a no brainer. All living things must be able to reproduce their own species. Now, I, I find that unique right there because evolutionists try to tell us that this may make this, or this makes this, or we came from primordial soup. You make yourself, you make your own species. We don't make other animals, and other animals don't make us. That's why some animals become extinct. If they, if they wasn't going to come become extinct, I mean, there'd be other animals making them to replace them if they couldn't replace themselves. It, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And then we get to number four, possession of a genetic program, DNA and RNA. We'll have part of chapter five, that, that's a genetics chapter, that we'll spend quite a bit on DNA and RNA. We'll have a full class on trying to break down and understand the DNA RNA concept. Metabolism number five, sum of all chemical reactions in the body. There's your basic definition. Sum of all chemical reactions in the body. Physiology, just using one example here, is a study of complex metabolic functions. That's us trying to understand, when, if, if you ever go on and take physiology, we will try to grasp an understanding of how the body functions. And if you try to memorize how the body functions, it won't ever work because everybody's body functions a little different. And if you haven't ever thought about that, you think, well, we eat the same food, you know, it goes down the same hatch, comes out the same end, you know, and it's, it's pretty simple. We have two ears, but does everybody here have exact same vision? You know, does everybody here like the same food? I'd, I'd venture to say that if we opened up everybody's stomach in here and studied the bacteria and the flora that lives in your stomach, everybody's stomach would be slightly different because of the type of foods you eat. They even did a study in, in uh, cattle and bovines that here was this, this one, there's two dairy cows in the same herd is what it was. And this, they, they, the research hypothesis was that they're in the same herd, they eat the same feed, uh, they, they grew up here together, they didn't come in, from the, they were born here, raised here. Their stomach flora would be very, very similar. They didn't say identical, but be very similar. They knocked them both out, they opened both their stomachs up, studied the flora, and found that the flora was significantly different. Okay, even to the point they took a bunch of stuff out of this one and put it in this one, and they put a bunch of stuff in this one and this one to change their stomach flora. Over a period of time, they open them back up and their flora, the bacteria and stuff that lives in their stomach, was back to what it was. The ones they didn't like, their body didn't like, they had killed off and they had started growing the ones the body did like. Now that's uniqueness. That, that certainly and certainly uh, this complex metabolic function makes each and every one of us so individually different, it's not even funny. And you can even, well in fact one of those cases, uh, one of the researchers didn't believe it, uh, that that was happening so much, they thought something else was going on, that he actually went back in one of the cows and used formaldehyde to kill off all the flora in this cow's stomach to see what she would build back on her own, it killed her. So the research, 
what the researcher figured out is that you can't kill off all the flora and expect animal. I mean, he sterilized her stomach and it killed her because we need these bugs, what we would call them bugs, we need our normal flora to keep us healthy. They help us digest, they help our immune system, they help everything. You kill them off, you ever take a strong antibiotic and, and get diarrhea, upset stomach, just tear you up? Anybody? Are you all alive? I see it all the time in the hospital. Yeah. Well, it's killing the stuff we wanted to kill, but it's killing all the good stuff too. And so and they tell you to take it with food, which will minimize that a little bit. But if you can all, if you, I mean, if you can take uh, acidophilus or anything to go with it, uh, it'll help build that back. It's killing it off, and you need to build it back, and it'll take time to do so. So that's metabolism. <clears throat> Development. This is probably my favorite one here. All organisms pass through a characteristic life cycle. And characteristic life cycles for some animals are pretty short. I mean, some birds don't live very long. Some animals can uh, reproduce within, a, within the first year of their life. Some animals may take years and years before they can reproduce. Uh, aphids, a very, very small insect, it can actually be born pregnant. So, I mean, they really had a choice in that, didn't they? <laughs> so, you know, this, this developmental thing, uh, let's use, uh, use a deer, for instance. Okay, a, a deer is born within minutes it's up nursing within hours it's pretty agile and can move along pretty good and within the next year it can reproduce okay it can go on and reproduce and do what it needs to do uh, rats and mice i mean usually within the same breeding season the first offspring of this parent are already reproducing toward the end of that breeding season so you, you know, those things, they reproduce a lot of offspring. A, a, a rabbit may actually have six litters in one year. Well, and if that first and second litter is early enough, they're actually starting to reproduce for the years out. They may not have six, but they might have a couple litters. You ever heard re reproducing like a rabbit? Well, that's why, because they can just, and gestation's short, I think it's about 21 days. So that's how that can happen. And then, and then if we can take humans and, you know, and at 30 years old, they're still living at home. That's supposed to be funny, but y'all, I'm going to have my work cut out with y'all. Here, I'll give you girls some advice. How many of y'all is married? Okay, it's too late for y'all. The rest of you can learn from this. It's not too late. The day you get married is the day you start raising your first child think about that. You're married, so now you understand it. Mm -hmm. You're not married, not not living with him yet. Uh, you round him quite a bit. Oh, it won't be that bad. Well, marry him, live with him, and see what it's like, right? Right. And then when you have children, then you have a big child and a little child. Mm -hmm. And the only difference between men and boys is the size of the pants and the price of the toys. Mm -hmm. So now you're even more in debt. Because we got to have this. we got to have we got to have a boat. we got to have a camp. We gotta, gotta have a big gun. Let's go shoot something. <laughs> but that's, uh, you can live by that. One of these days, you'll roll over and say, Lord, I wish I'd listen to my zoology teacher. <laughs> it's too late for you, though. It's too late. Yeah, once you're hitched, you're hitched. There's no going back. You gotta put up with it. All right. So, developmental is all across the board. We can even look at gestations. We said rats and mice are 21 days. Uh, like 60 days for dogs or 62 days for dogs and you get into the largest mammal a baleen whale and then it's gestation or pregnancy is 12 months yeah, well nobody wants to be pregnant for 12 months ours is 38 to 40 weeks in humans and then you look at an elephant they're pregnant for 22 months so, but once they get here they're half grown right <laughs> good lord get them here and, you know rats and mice they're born naked and helpless and We'll even talk about kangaroos. Kangaroos literally stay pregnant all the time. 
they, they give birth with a 33-day gestation. And when they give birth, the, the young's not much bigger than the end of my pinky. And blind, helpless, and naked, it has to find its way into the pouch. It has to crawl up and over into the pouch, and then find a nipple to, to get some milk, okay? At the same time, mom probably just kicked one joy out of the pouch. So there's one running around out here that still needs milk, so it's coming back for milk. Mom's got one in the pouch now, if it made it. That's why they stay pregnant all the time. You know, what do you think the death toll these little ones are? Yeah, because they've got pretty good ways to travel to get to where they're going. So the one in the pouch uh, gets a specialized high-fat milk. One out of the pouch has been weaned from high-fat. It's a low-fat diet now. That's specialized milk. And then she gets pregnant again. And not for immediate uh, delivery, but she'll get pregnant and it'll reach 100 cell stage growth and just sit there. If the one in the pouch dies or she loses it, then that, that'll start growing again and give almost immediate birth just within a, a small time frame. If the one in the pouch survives the whole time frame, it, it'll be months before that one starts growing again. But when she kicks that one out of the pouch, this one starts, starts coming. So there's some unique stuff out there, I'm telling you. All right, the last one here is environmental interaction. This is uh, irritability. This is responding to environmental stimuli. If it's cold outside, you put on more clothes. If it's warm outside, we find a cool spot or, or wear shorts. You know, it's just, that's, uh, that's us responding. Animals, they shed hair in the spring preparing for a hot summer and they add hair on getting ready for a winter. They, some animals can't live in cold, cold climates. Some animals can't live very well in warm environments. That's why you find them in the environments they do the best in. So environmental interaction. If they don't survive this environment, then guess what happens to that species in this environment? We'll find places you think, well, there ought to be frogs everywhere here. There's no frogs in New Zealand. You think, well, there's a lot of places that they ought to survive. They're not there. Now, if you want to find a snake, go to Australia. They, uh, I think 80% of their snakes are poisonous. And it's not just a little poison, they're a whole lot poisonous. <laughs> so if you like snakes, move to Australia. If you don't like snakes, don't go over there. All right, brings us to the first law of thermodynamics. <clears throat> The first law basically says energy is neither created nor destroyed, it's just changed from one form to another. We've heard this throughout our whole life. And mechanical to, to heat in a car engine is one of the easiest examples. So the engine uh, fires up, starts from electrical. It starts and as its parts are running, that mechanical turns into heat energy and what happens to the heat? A lot of it's just lost, isn't it? But it's another form of energy. Second law of thermodynamics, physical systems tend to proceed toward a state of greater disorder. So pay close attention to this one right here because this one in itself disproves evolution. Uh, evolution, if we were to put a definition to evolution, that definition would be the ability to adapt or change. That's going to be your definition, and it's true. You have to be able to adapt or change, or you may not survive different conditions that's thrown at you even in the same environment. But according to this law, evolutionists say that if we came from primordial soup, or if we came from a monkey, or if we came from the Big Bang Theory, uh, there's so many different theories out there. If we came from a smaller organism like they originally state, even as small as maybe even an amoeba, a single cell organism, <coughs> then we'd have to proceed into a state of greater order. What happens to us with age? Do we get stronger and younger? Our bodies proceed to a state of more disorder, does it? This system not as working as well as it used to. Believe me, you're gonna find systems that just don't work like they used to. And of course, they got a drug for everything, but they cause other problems, so. This, this, this right here states the truth, and that truth disproves evolution. There's some unique theories out there to study, for sure. But 
evolution as evolution wants it to exist cannot exist. Can't. They need a lot of time frame, which everything they date, they'll have it billions of years old. And everything that we tend can date on the earth has the earth five to seven thousand years old. So, and seven's pushing up or into that. So there's a lot of discrepancies, but I think it's pretty simple in just looking at that right there. We all know everything over time. You drive off the lot with that new car at 250,000 miles later, it's not driving like that new car, is it? We get to looking across that car lot again, don't we? <laughs> Trade it in on a little better one. You know, if you can afford it, good luck with that. Any questions there? Y'all are just so full of interest and curiosity. Procurious and eukaryotes. To see this again a little bit later, but we probably won't spend much time on it. Most everything we're going to talk about in this book, 99.9% .9 is going to be eukaryotes. And the other maybe point something percent is prokaryotes, and I'm going to cover it now. It's bacteria and blue green algae. Everything else is eukaryotes. And if you want to study more prokaryote, which some of y'all will, you'll take microbiology eventually, you'll study a lot more of this stuff right here. So a eukaryote, by definition, means true nucleus. Uh, they tend to have more complex organelles, and the organelles seem to be larger. Does that mean these are less functional? No. They may be smaller, less complex. They may have fewer organelles. <coughs> the bacteria survive quite well. We've got it in us, all over us, on the table, in the air we breathe. So we certainly can't say that's a lesser organism to us as far as numbers and survival because they can do it. They, they may actually wreak some havoc to us a lot. So there's your comparison. On the first test, I'll probably ask you basic, and I do a lot of literal definitions, which is Latin-based. Prokaryote literally in Latin means no true nucleus. Eukaryote means true nucleus. So they're good, simple, basic definitions that you'll find some on the first test. Scientific method. We already mentioned some of this already. We, we probably do this more than you think. <coughs> Scientific method, you uh, observe a situation, you create a hypothesis, you secure more information that supports your hypothesis, and then you have a theory. Uh, it may be something as simple as you got a rattle on your vehicle, and you think, well, I think that's a, that's a rock in the hubcap, or that's a a rock or dirt in the brakes, you know, something squeak, squeak, squeak. So you commence to figure out if that's what it, what it is or not. So you drive it around some more, and every time you do this, it does that. Yeah, I think that's, that, that, that is supporting that. Then you pull the tire off to clean out the dirt out of there, and it's not it at all. You, you wore your brakes plumb out. But you messed that up, didn't you? So your theory was shot, but now you know the real cause. We do this kind of stuff all the time. We just don't think about that this is what we're doing. We don't sit down, okay, now I've got to do the scientific method to figure this out. That's not something that's in our vocabulary a lot. But we do a lot of this. Now, as far as we go is the theory. Your basic definitions, hypothesis, we've always known as an educated guess. We're going to put a little twist to this. Now, I love the old book's definition of this. Hypothesis is not necessarily an educated guess, but it's a tentative speculation. Does that not roll off the tongue and make you sound smarter? <laughs> tentative speculation. It just makes you sound smarter. So we'll leave here today smarter than we came in. Because it's not an old educated guess anymore, like you learned in high school or even grade school for that matter. It's, it's a tentative speculation. That's what it is. More observation than the theory. The, by the time we get to the theory, if we if it's a theory, we've supported it with mass amount of evidence. We've got a lot of stuff backing it up, and we'll run across stuff in here that once was this, but now is this because we've learned it's different. By the scientific method, we've proven it wrong. In natural law, 
uh, in natural science, we won't really get into a lot of laws. These are all physical science laws. If you Kepler's law, law of gravity, Newton's law, these are all physical science laws. They affect us. But uh, natural science, we really kind of stop at the theory thing. And it changes all the time. That's why they call this class uh, three hours theory, the terminology. It's because what I'll tell you today and what we know today may change 10 years from now or could change tomorrow. Physiology is a young science. I mean, stuff us was teaching them 10 years ago, some of that's even obsolete because we're learning more and more and more. So all this is subject to change at any given time. So there's your scientific method. <clears throat> Mark uh, E there at Mark Evolution. I think I'm going to quit there and and we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about evolution. I've got a little piece of paper I like to read if I can find it and, and apply it back to the second law of thermodynamics. And we'll start up there on Tuesday. We'll uh, just meet back in here Tuesday at 11. Or excuse me, not 11. Tuesday at 1 for your class time. And then Thursday, we'll, we'll meet in here at 11, do our class, and then run up and do our lab. When we get done with our lab, then you're free to go. Okay? Any questions? Oh, you're going to have to talk this semester. All right. See you.